Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your hurricane outlook and discussion. As we discuss today, Hurricane Barrel and 96L, but Hurricane Barrel right now, the top story, and it looks like it's going to impact some portion of the Lesser Antilles as a tropical cyclone, maybe a hurricane, maybe less. We shall see. It is interesting. They refer to it as Brazen Barrel in the advisory from the 11 o'clock package. It said Brazen Barrel continues to intensify or something like that. I like that little adjective on there. Very feisty little system. We have a lot to talk about today. Uh, a lot of different graphics that I'm going to be showing. You can see up there those tabs uh, loaded and ready to go. So let's get rid of me for the time being and take a look starting with the broad view satellite animation here from tropicaltidbits.com and here is 96L. This is going to be something that we're going to be talking about more and more. In fact, I mean, my office is like right there, so it's in my backyard practically, the watery part of it anyway. And then out here is tiny, tiny Hurricane Barrel. I mean, get used to saying that, Hurricane Barrel. Uh, just a couple of days ago, it didn't look like it was going to do anything. And here it is, a hurricane with winds of 80 miles per hour or so, and forecast to strengthen from there. You can see the Saharan air layer up here to the north, and that's the key here. This is still protected from that Saharan air outbreak, and Barrel is taking advantage of the conditions around it. The whole system is only a few tens of miles wide, honestly. And, you know, if it passed 50 miles away from you, you probably wouldn't even know it was there. So let's get rid of this tab and look at the precipitable water. This shows us exactly just that, how much water is in the atmosphere. And all of this red and orange coloring through here and then over here with 96L and even a tropical wave right here moving into Central America indicates that there's a lot of water vapor and precipitable water to be wrung out in the atmosphere. And why is that important? Well, we see that these blues up here, this is all the drier air, and this little injection of moisture coming over the top to the north of Barrel is very interesting to me because there is no overwhelming Saharan air trying to get infused into this system or ingested into it. So Barrel is going to keep barreling along here. You can see that counterclockwise rotation, and it's moving along just north of 10 latitude. And so you folks in the Lesser Antilles and we'll zoom in and talk about this more in detail in a moment. This is going to be a problem for you. It didn't look like it yesterday. I bought into it. I mean, the modeling suggested you, know, you go with what's in front of you, and it's not always going to be a slam dunk. It's not perfect. Uh, these are probabilities, okay? And so sometimes uh, it's going to be wrong, so to speak, and in this case, wrong on the fact that this is going to degenerate into an open wave. Now watch when I say that. That's exactly what it'll do. But things change even when you're looking out just a few days. Things can change. Now, something else to pay attention to, this is this trough right here coming in. And it's not very deep, okay? It's not a big longitudinal trough like that. And so this trough, this piece of energy up here with this upper level energy, this trough digging in, and then it's going to lift out and leave 96L behind and how close it gets tucked in to the southeast coast of the U.S., North Carolina, South Carolina, will determine who gets what impacts later on. Like I said, there is a lot to talk about. All right, so I know that this updated right before I hit the record button. Let's see if that's reflected yet in the graphic part. Yep, it is. Okay, so here, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, not much change, 70 and 80% respectively over the next several days. But the interesting part let me just click on the text here. The forecaster here, forecaster Berg, mentions that it's got the upper level winds and everything conducive, the environmental conditions to be more specific, conducive for additional development of this system, and a tropical depression is likely to form. I think that's almost a certainty. Uh, and then it says right here that it'll move slowly northwestward and stall or meander near the coast of North Carolina over the weekend. All right, so this right here tells me we have a problem because a developing tropical cyclone is going to be near the coast of North Carolina when? Over the weekend. What's the weekend? That's when everybody heads to the beach. 
and our tourism industry depends on people going to the beach. Our beaches are wonderful here. They're wonderful in most places of the world, uh, certainly. But this is a problem because we're going to have people coming down into what will be eventually high rip current probabilities, things like that. And so the headaches begin because it's the middle of summer uh, and the water temperatures are very warm and this is forming at a time and in a location that is not optimal for anyone. So 96L here, we're really going to have to start talking about that more over the coming days. Then, of course, we have barrel. No watches and warnings up just yet, but that may change fairly soon. This is what the track map looks like from the National Hurricane Center site. And yes, you folks right in here in the central part of the Lesser Antilles from Barbados north, you're going to really need to watch this closely. And, I mean, it could pass between some of these islands and you would hardly notice it. Depending on how large the envelope of energy gets or if it changes its shape, and all of that really does matter. It doesn't have a large circulation to begin with, so I don't think it's going to expand too much, but you never know. So nevertheless, it is forecast, as you can see, to remain a viable tropical cyclone, a storm or a hurricane here, presumably a tropical storm only through here, wind-wise. Uh, it will bring the potential to some very, for some very heavy rain here for parts of the Dominican Republic, maybe Haiti. So now we have a problem. It's more than just a novelty of, okay, it's going to develop out here and then fizzle out. And that's what's interesting. Last year, Don uh, formed fairly early in the season down in this area, but then it dissipated fairly quickly. TD4 out here somewhere also didn't do much uh, and died before in entering the Caribbean, whereas this system looks like it may survive into the northeast part of the Caribbean Sea, and as such, we're going to need to watch this very closely. We still have a day or two before we have to worry about specific impacts, uh, but areas that were hit very hard by Maria, unfortunately, you may have to deal with some rather inclement weather as this passes through. We will zero in on that over the next couple of days, so get ready. Uh, hopefully this will degenerate some, if not a lot, but you can't put hope as your only planning tool. All right, I know there's a lot of blue tarps, a lot of houses that are still wrecked in Dominica and vicinity, uh, so be ready. All right, do what you can. People down there hopefully hyper aware and are paying attention and will be ready for this and neighbors can help neighbors. So here's what it looks like on the satellite animation, this beautiful Go 16 high resolution product. This particular animation put together by Levi Cowan at Tropical Tidbits. And you can see the overall envelope of the system, fairly small, very, very well defined convective bands on the south and west sides, a little tiny, what we call CDO or central dense overcast with the eye popping in and out. Overall, very well organized, tight circulation, moving off to the west not at a very fast pace. It is expected that it will pick up some forward speed, but it's not moving west. And I've been remarking on this the last couple of days. It's not barreling off to the west. No pun intended. I'm seriously, I'm just, that's the term. It's not steaming ahead at 25 miles per hour or anything like that. And, uh, and so for now, that's good for its organization and not necessarily obviously good for those in its path. This is 96L, gradually getting better organized, as you can see off the Carolina coast here. Uh, here's Cape Hatteras, and then Ocracoke, Atlantic Beach, Moorhead City area, and then there's Wilmington, and then Myrtle Beach down here, Norfolk, uh, and then you get up here towards Atlantic City, New Jersey, and vicinity. So this really needs to be watched. Here comes that approaching front. This will dig in a little bit and then lift out. The energy will lift out and it won't be enough to sweep this out to sea. Instead, it'll get left behind and wait until you see where it is headed. All right, we'll look at that in a moment in terms of the energy potential. Moving along, the vorticity signature showing the structure of these systems at the lower levels. I like to use this map or this graphic. It's a map with graphics on it. And you can see it looks like a little bit of a teardrop now, but there is your well-organized vorticity signature of 96L. And by the way, real quick, 
What does that mean, 96L? For those of you that have never heard, or you've heard it and you wondered what it is, when there is an area of suspect weather, the Hurricane Center will designate a number, and they use 90 through 99, and then recycle them again, and the letter L is for Atlantic. Does that make sense? And actually, it's AL, technically, and in the Eastern Pacific, it's EP for Eastern Pacific, but we just call them, you know, and they do the same thing. Separate numbers, though, 90 through 99E, uh, and the Westpac, 90 through 99W, so forth and so on. An adopted naming convention around the world for different meteorological organizations who track tropical cyclones. That's a good way to keep up with them in their formative stages. So this one is 96L, or Invest Area. That's a terrible... I'm trying to write with a mouse, 96L, and then there is, of course, Hurricane Barrel, covered up by a hurricane symbol, but we can see from the satellite imagery that, yes, it definitely has decent vorticity associated with it, obviously. All right, so the modeling from earlier today, a new set will come out soon, and this shows us a very tight envelope, for the most part, of guidance here. You know, we're not seeing crazy stuff like this, where it's just all spread out everywhere. Oftentimes, this is referred to as the spaghetti plot. And generally speaking, a west-northwest track through the Eastern Caribbean Sea with an intersection, unfortunately, for parts of the islands here, the Lesser Antilles first, and then heading towards perhaps Hispaniola, maybe Jamaica. We just need to see how much latitude this gains. The only thing that kind of, I won't say worries me, let's just say something to keep in the back of our minds if this travels obviously over the greater antilles especially hispaniola it probably won't survive especially considering the small envelope it's a very small fragile system all right so probably wouldn't survive you never say never of course and if it goes south then we have potentially something to track later down the road but that's just something to keep in the back of our minds for later. I'm not concerned about it. I don't have any inside knowledge. It's just experience says you don't let these things go until they're gone. Obviously, look what Beryl has done so far. In terms of intensity, earlier this morning, the uh, early run here, the 12 UTC, that means it was initialized at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. So 70 knots now. Some of the modeling touching CAT 2. Generally speaking, most of the models keeping this as a hurricane until this pretty big drop-off as conditions purportedly will be less favorable after about 60 hours or so. So we'll see. We'll just keep watching. I think this is going to be one of the ones where you're just going to have to watch and see how things evolve. Now, the early morning guidance for 96L, kind of a mishmash of possibilities. Some of the global models get it much closer to the Outer Banks. Others are much farther out, so this is still too soon to call, as they say, because it's going to be a meanderer. Is that a word? A meanderer. It is now uh, right close to the North Carolina coast. Uh, different runs of the different models bring it, like I said, some of them are further down here, and then it moves kind of like that. It's just hard to say, but we will go over some of the other guidance here in a moment. In terms of intensity, yeah, um, that should get your attention a little bit. Is it wild and you know out of bounds, so to speak, like an outlier? I'm going to say no because of one very important thing. Maybe two, but the most important is this right here, if I can get it to work. The upper ocean heat content where 96L is expected to hang out and meander is decent. All right, so there is not only a warm surface, I've been talking about this, 28, 29 Celsius, but the Gulf Stream, which is a continuing current of warm water, and the, this meandering on top of that, you just get a conveyor belt of more heat content. So this could, at some point, become a strong hurricane. That would not surprise me in the least, as some of this guidance is indicating over the next few days. So we're going to have to really, really watch that, not just because, oh, it might affect North Carolina directly. Well, the indirect impacts of high swells, the rip currents, the beach erosion, whatever, all of that needs to be taken into consideration. And when I see fairly 
substantial ocean heat content for early July, that causes me some concern. So pay attention to this, folks. And this, too, the UK Met guidance, a very overall reliable model here, a global model, the United Kingdom Met model. Uh, and this is the text output. So it's indicating that a new tropical cyclone will forecast after about a day and a half. Will forecast? I caught that. Forecast to develop after about 36 hours. Where? Well, at about 33.1 north, 75.6 west. Where's that? Well, Hatteras is roughly 75.5 or so. That's the longitude of Cape Hatteras. And about 34 and a half, if memory serves, or 35 and a half, something like that. I think it's 35. But once you get 34 north, 75 west, then you get close enough to the Outer Banks to have issues. All right? So it's forecast to develop fairly close to the North Carolina coast. And you can see that here, the different times over the next several days. And it gets as far back west as about 76.4 right here. And it's strengthening, 34.5, 76.4, so you know, almost back to Cape Lookout and just south of Ocracoke in that region uh, and strengthening, you know, about 990 millibars coming down from 1015. So what this tells me, uh, put a big check mark on this, we really need to take this seriously. This has done a good job over the last few days with the evolution of this system and it gets it close enough to the Outer Banks. I mean, look at that right there, 34.6757, you know, that's really close there. Uh, and just south of, of Ocracoke and Hatteras as a hurricane. And that is, what, the 7th? So, um, I'm sorry, not the 7th, that's the month. That's the night of the 10th into the 11th. So, 8 p.m. on the night of the 10th, roughly. Zero Z on the 10th. Got to watch this, all right? Let's don't let this slip away, so to speak. And we, you know, not fascinated by barrel, but... Watching barrel so closely that, yikes, we don't pay attention to that, especially since I live here. So this is another thing that bothers me. Look at this. 29 degrees Celsius already right here next to and adjacent to the Outer Banks. Pamlico Sound, for what it's worth, 29 and 30 Celsius. 84, 85 degree surface temperatures, fairly deep, substantial ocean heat content, and it's only July. So this could be a problem in the coming days. Um, what else? Okay, the ship's guidance, I wanted to talk about this. And this is a little bit technical, but I'm going to try to get through it to explain to you why Barrel is doing what it's doing. Okay, so this is the ship's diagnostics. Kind of like printing out all the things going on with your automobile. And in an ideal situation, you want everything to be positive and green and, you know, no reds or faults or errors. So the ship's diagnostics is a way to diagnose the heat engine of hurricane barrel in this case. So here are your times up here, zero hour, six hours out, 12, so forth and so on. Um, how close it is to land, etc. And you can I think, right? Yeah, there's no land. So land interaction, not a problem. And um, it looks like, I guess, did they run it on the LGEM track? Part of this I don't fully understand, but what I do understand is the shear. And the shear is right now 8 knots, 7 knots, 3 knots, 9 knots, and then it increases fairly destructively by about 72 hours, okay? Uh, other things to look at, sea surface temperatures, 27.2 Celsius, which is about 81 degrees. At the 200 millibar level, or at a, you know just under 40,000 feet up, the air temperature is minus 55 Celsius. That's a little over 80 degrees, if my math is right, difference in the surface of the ocean to the top of this hurricane. That is a tremendous, and let's put it a different way. Um, eight miles is about 40,000 feet, plus or minus. It's 5,280 feet in a mile. Let's just round it down and call it 5,000 feet. So 5 times 7 is 35, 5 times 8 is 40, right? So 40,000 feet plus or minus is a mile. I'm just, just approximating here uh, is 7 or 8 miles is what I'm trying to say. I'm screwing this up. But the, so in, the, in less than 8 miles in the atmosphere in the vertical, the, there's an 80-something degree temperature difference. 
That is a big reason why this is doing as well as it's doing. That's incredible. And to give you perspective, when we launched our balloon uh, during Hurricane Nate last year near Biloxi, Mississippi, the surface temperature, as measured by the sensor itself, was also about 27 Celsius. It was about 81 degrees. And then, much higher up at about 59,000 feet, before the balloon reached burst altitude, we measured a temperature of minus 74 Celsius, which is about eh, 103 below zero. So that temperature difference over not very much atmosphere is a big driver in that instability in the atmosphere so that air can lift into a colder atmosphere. If everything's a uniform temperature, you don't have any reason for there to be weather. Does that make sense? And so when we see these cold temperatures in the upper part of the atmosphere, we know that it's not capped. There's not a warm layer up there. And so the buoyant air at the surface is able to just keep going and become more buoyant and lift what we call the lifted uh, index and other things related to that, the instability. Severe weather folks, the uh, tornado chasers know a lot about that. And the lifted indice values are more about tornadoes, but in this case, this is very important, that minus 55. So I know I spent a lot of time on that, but there you go, 200 millibar temperature is very cold. Um, the relative humidity, I know that's in here somewhere, yeah, marginal, 60% um, or so, then it drops. So it's got moisture, it's got warm sea surface temperatures, it's got the instability, so that's a big reason why this is going the way it is. Now for 96L, still in its formative stage, not even a depression yet, but looking at a few of these parameters, the shear forecast to drop uh, and stay fairly low over the next five days. The 200 millibar temperature, nice and cold, so no issues there. The relative humidity, though, is not very impressive in the mid-50s, and then it seems to try to drop there before going up again. We'll see how this changes over time. We'll watch this as it progresses. But both systems, the bottom line, are in marginally favorable but on the positive side of marginal for development and they're trying to take advantage of that is what it all comes down to and all of that despite this the MJO the Madden Julian oscillation when we see it over here in phases 8 1 and 2 especially and especially 1 and 2 that's favorable for the Atlantic Basin Western Hemisphere uh, generally speaking where is it now Right now it's in the null phase, so there's no discernible major MJO activity anywhere, but it is forecast to head over into phases five and six, which would generally favor activity out towards the West Pacific, which is where we have a typhoon now. This is the GFS, this is the Euro. My point, despite no favorable MJO in our part of the world, where we're watching most of us anyway, Western Hemisphere, no MJO. There's no enhancing factor, feature, whatever, large scale, and yet we have a hurricane and probably another one that's going to develop within the next five days, which would, by the way, the name would be Chris. So, in the Westpac, not to leave you folks completely ignored, Typhoon Maria. Why is there a Maria when there was a Maria that got retired from the Atlantic Basin list of names? Well, it just happened to be on the Westpac list of names and... Uh, for whatever reason, they didn't decide to take it off. I mean, it's not that big of a deal, but hearing the name Typhoon Maria or anything Maria related to the tropics, probably a little, you know, what do they say, too soon? But nevertheless, this is headed, according to the Joint Typhoon Warning Center, uh, eventually towards some of the southern islands of Japan here, and then maybe mainland China as a weakening typhoon. What do I take from this? other than there's a typhoon headed for a large Asian country. Uh, I'll tell you what I take from it. It's not doing this, recurving. What is it doing? It's moving northwest into China. And if we know, I've learned from people like Joe Bastardi and others, uh, Larry Cosgrove, if you know his work, and um, uh, Dave Tolaris at Weather Risk. I'm just trying to give credit where credit is due. This tells me when you don't see them recurving like that, that perhaps six to ten days down the road, more 
ridging over the northwestern part of the Atlantic. And what would that mean? We have to watch Chris even closely when it develops. It's all connected rather loosely in some cases, in others it can be very tight, that connection. So as you can see, there's a lot going on in the tropics. Let me get to my exit page here. Uh, and we got a lot to keep up with. As far as barrel, the biggest thing is anxiety for folks that had to deal with Maria especially. Not so much for those that are still recovering from Irma, even though having this head your way at all is probably a little bit unnerving. We're not going to really know about the impacts for another couple of days. And because barrel is so small, we're going to have to just wait and see as it approaches how close it gets to any of these islands. But it's looking more likely that a viable tropical system will be passing through parts of the Lesser Antilles before all is said and done. Then, of course, we've got to watch what will soon be Chris, I do believe, and that's going to have some big problems evolving over time for parts of the North Carolina coast, South Carolina possibly as well, and even Southeast Virginia. As far as direct impacts, again, you know the drill. It's too soon to know for sure, but I'll be on top of it. You can follow on Twitter. I'm also on Patreon. That is our newest way to do two things. I'll talk about this for a moment, then I'll sign off. It's a great way to raise money. This is my job. This is what I do for a living. I've done this for 22 years. The funding changes every few years, it seems, either from corporate sponsors to uh, app sales or uh, who knows what. But right now, this idea of crowdfunding and then you know, being a creator, you're watching this, most of you on YouTube, in one form or another, whether it's on your YouTube TV kind of thing, the apps on these smart TVs, or on your you know phone or iPad or Android device, I'm a creator. I'm creating hurricane content, uh, news information, and then of course what I do that most people don't do that provide these kind of updates is when they hit land, I take you out there in person. And we set up equipment like this right here to capture what's going on. This is a GoPro inside of there for recording. We also stream it live, we collect weather data and do all sorts of other things. And that is supported by that right down there. The Patreon, it's a great way to um, be a patron and say, hey, you know what? This is worthy of my support from a dollar standpoint. And if you can, it really does help, all right? And uh, then the second thing we can do with that is the app itself is amazing and what I can post in there and so forth. So please do check that out if you get a chance. Uh, at the end of the day, though, I'm just glad you're watching. I do appreciate it. And with that being said, I am Mark Suddeth for HurricaneTrack.com. The website, that's where it all started. That's still there, too. We have all this social media and everything else, but we still have the website. So for HurricaneTrack.com, yep, I'm Mark Suddeth. Thanks for watching. I'll be back with more for you tomorrow.